experimental feature as well. It means that the magnetic cross-section uh, is of the same order of magnitudes as, as the uh, nuclear cross-section. So I actually can see, you know, at the same, at the same uh, overall scale uh, in the cross-section, I am sensitive to magnetism as well as uh, the, nuclear the, the nuclear structure in the material. Uh, so this is good. Um, what I should remind you actually, because sometimes I know this kind of rushes by, which is that um, we are often not able to separate the magnetic and the nuclear scattering. So I'll do a measurement and I'll have both of those things contributing in my detector at the same time. And so this can actually become somewhat of a challenge to, to be able to separate out these two uh, contributions. There are ways that we do that and I might get into examples of that later, but uh, keep in mind that uh, all of it is present at once and you have to kind of disentangle it uh, experimentally. All right, I think I have a little example of um, uh, a kind of a cute example of how you can use this special contrast um, between the neutron and the nucleus to, uh, to do radiography actually. And so, um, so again, you know, the cross sections of interaction uh, very uh, sort of erratically through the, uh, the um, uh, periodic table. So I can detect all sort of biological materials which typically have carbon, nitrogen, hydrogen in them. Those we are actually very sensitive to. And so this uh, poor wasp which is trapped in a, um, in a uh, this, is, this is some sort of steel uh, pincer or something like that. He's sitting trapped in that. And uh, this, is the, the, um, this is the optical image with neutrons uh, you know, you can, you can see that I get as much scattering with really great detail of the, of the structure of the wasp itself as well as the, uh, uh, as the steel tip that he's attached to. So, so this is, uh, this is the, the great contrast to light atoms. In fact, if I was to put this wasp inside a, inside a lead casket, I could still see it through the casket because, uh, because of this uh, great contrast to the light elements and uh, I'm not necessarily scattering more strongly from the heavy elements. Okay. So that's, we won't talk more about neutron radiography, but that is actually quite a useful, um, useful applications of neutrons as well. Okay, so now we're going to dive a bit into talking about the magnetic properties of the, of the neutron and the way that it interacts with, um, uh, with the internal magnetic field distribution in materials. Uh, so let's see, so uh, the mass of the neutron is about a thousand times more than the electron, um, and it means that the um, that the magnetic dipole moment of the neutron is about a factor of a thousand less than the, uh, than the electron. So it's a really, really small dipole moment, um, but it is sufficient that it gives rise to magnetic scattering that we can measure, which has the same strength as the, uh, as the nuclear scattering cross-section approximately. Uh, so the interaction potential would be uh, that of a dipole in the magnetic field. So this is the dipole moment operator of the neutron. This is the uh, internal field in the material. Um, and I'm correspondingly going to get uh, both a torque acting on the neutron and I'm going to get a force acting on the neutron if the magnetic field is, is not uniform. So once it's non-uniform then I'll have a force and I'll, I'll always have a, a, a torque unless I'm parallel to the magnetic field. So this basically drives the neutron towards um, high field regions and, uh, and it orients it parallel to that uh, field configuration. This is kind of the, the classical description of what is uh, uh, what is going to be going, uh, going on. And then I'd like to, to, uh, to introduce the concept of magnetic scattering uh, by first thinking about um, uh, actually a neutron optic uh, uh, situation. Um, so, <coughs> uh, so this will involve a description of the material which is a kind of an electromagnetic description where I've averaged over the uh, size of I've averaged over several unit cells, let's say multiple unit cells, so I have an overall uh, density of nuclei and that gives rise to an overall uh, um, um, interaction potential with the nuclear density and I also have an overall magnetization just like I do in electromagnetism and this will give rise to an overall um, uh, uh, uniform interaction potential with the magnetization density. And this will then uh, this will then uh, give rise to a, an effective index of refraction for the neutron uh, where V is the overall strength of this interaction potential and E is the, en the kinetic energy of the neutron and um, because V is going to be a positive uh, potential that is there's, there's actually a 
um, there's a, an energy barrier that I cross as I enter into the material because of the presence of these interaction potentials, uh, then the index of refraction that I get out of this is a little bit less than one. So that's different from in optics um, with, uh, with light, where the index of refraction is going, to be, uh, is going to be larger than one in materials so that the speed of light becomes, um, becomes less in materials than in the vacuum. With a neutron, it's sort of the other way around. The optically dense, or the, the um, optically dense material for the neutron uh, is actually the vacuum. And then it, it's as if uh, I have a less than one index of refraction once I enter into the material. So that means that if I, um, uh, if, I <coughs> if I interact from, if I have um, uh, a, an interface between, um, between, uh, this would be, let's say, material. N is less than one, and this might be vacuum. Uh, N equals to one. Then I can actually have, um, I can actually have total external reflection. So if this, if this angle of, of incidence is sufficiently, is sufficiently small, then I can be in a situation where I cannot actually get into the material at all, and I'm just going to be I can create a, um, I can create actually a guided structure if I was, if you were to imagine that I would have two such, uh, such surfaces and then I can sort of bounce back and forth and have essentially a waveguide for neutrons. And that actually works and it's how we propagate the neutrons forward to our instruments while not losing them uh, into, uh, in, in, into the shielding material for example. So, so that's pretty cool. Uh, we can also use this techniques to actually polarize the neutron. Because if you imagine you come in with a beam which is unpolarized, the neutrons uh, in both uh, directions, up and down, for example, out of the board and into the board, uh, then I can place myself in such a situation, if this material is magnetized, I can be in such a situation that only one of the spin states is, um, uh, is in total external reflection, and the other spin state uh, will actually be able to get into the material. And so then if I look at neutrons which are coming in this direction here, then I will only see that particular spin state. So I can use a magnetized material to actually polarize my neutron beam. And this is a technique we use as well. Okay, now, uh, as a final example of this, this kind of long wavelength description of um, the interaction between neutrons and material, I want to uh, give you an example of a type 2 superconductor. So we actually we took quite a big step here. Uh, and uh, I, I don't want to focus, in fact, on this particular material. It turns out to be quite an interesting compound, and I invite you to look at this paper. What I wanted to emphasize is that in a type 2 superconductor, uh, you have, um, such as this one, you have an internal field distribution which is um, influenced by, um, by the uh, uh, by the flux line lattice configuration. So I'm going to have an in inhomogeneous internal field distribution in these uh, type 2 superconductors when I apply a magnetic field. And this actually will give rise to, uh, in a semi-classical description, you can think of it as giving rise to forces on the electrons. You know, they actually like to be where the field is high and they like to be oriented along that field direction. Now the way that we would typically end up describing this um, is in terms of an interaction potential and we would develop an expression for the scattering cross-section and we would find that um, because of its, a, if it is a periodic flux line lattice distribution, we would have diffraction arising from that internal field distribution. And so these patterns shown here actually are showing you particular directions of diffracted neutrons beam, neutron beams arising from this uh, periodic um, internal field distribution on the, uh, let's say, 100 to 1,000 angstrom length scale. Um, and then you can go and look as a function of field and temperature and really map out the uh, flux line lattice configuration in materials using this kind of uh, technique. Okay, uh, do you have any more questions on that? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. The the uh, uh, the geometry that we would have here is as follows. Uh, so it has this would be my incident neutron beam, and then I would have a I would typically use a solenoid magnet. So 
I'd have a solenoid here. And this would be creating a magnetic field which is in this direction. And as a real result of that, I would have, uh, then inside this magnet, I would have my sample, superconducting type 2 superconducting material, and it would have uh, lines of flux that are passing through in this direction. Um, if I look uh, at, the, at this sample from this view here, so if I have my eye uh, here, I'm looking in here towards the sample, then I'll, I'll see the flux line lattice kind of uh, in some periodic arrangement like that. Now this will give rise to diffraction of the neutron in these particular directions, and then I'll have a detector placed back here, and that's the detector that I'm, I'm seeing, the, uh, I'm seeing the, the pattern of diffraction on the detector. And then from the location of the peaks and from their intensity and so on, I can infer more about the internal field distribution in the material. Other questions? Yes? Uh, the angle of scattering? What's the meaning of beta? Meaning of the beta? This is the goal. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That that is uh, that is a um, an okay. So that is an angle which is characterizing the um, the Bravais lattice associated with the flux line lattice. So if it if beta was was sixty, then I would have a hexagonal lattice. And if it's anything else, I think I have an oblique lattice. And then you can, uh, well, if it's 90, then I have another symmetry, which is a four-fold axis, then I have a square lattice. Yes? Uh, what does the color of the represent? Uh, what does the color represent? Oh, yeah. OK, good. Yeah. So you actually you're going to see in quite, quite a lot of examples these kinds of plots of uh, just color as a function of, in this case, momentum transfer. And in this case, uh, wanting to be brief, I haven't shown you the color scale, essentially. But uh, it probably goes from low intensity where it's blue and then high intensity where it's red. Um, so th this is proliferating more and more because we have these error detectors and we just get a lot of information. And they, they are very, very useful to get an overview. But you typically need to also look at the data as cuts along these directions to really understand the quality of the data. Yes? You said the gem? Yes. So, uh, and the neutral have a spin. Yes. So, if there is different spin direction, will they be split or have different track? Uh, yeah, so there will be a. Um, I'm going to lift the degeneracy between the two spin states when I break time reversal symmetry. Um, in this situation, um, yeah, so I, I do have to worry about what is each of those spin states doing. But in fact, um, what I end up, what end up, ends up happening is that it's actually a self-interference of each neutron with the, uh, with the um, internal field distribution in the material. So uh, it's, it's actually, even though the beam is unpolarized, uh, each neutron comes in with its particular spin state and will have an interference effect which produces this kind of pattern. And the next neutron comes in with a different spin state and also produces an interference effect. And then in the end, if I'm using an unpolarized beam, these things are then averaged. Um, and uh, that will then show up in my scattering cross-section that I had an unpolarized beam. Now, if I, was to, if I was to say, well, let me get some more information about this, I might choose to polarize this beam, this incident beam, in some particular direction. And then I'm, I might be able to get more detailed information about the internal field distribution coming from that. Um, but I will not be able to polarize the neutron beam really just by applying a, a humongous magnetic field. I'd have to, um, I have to use materials really to get the, um, you know, get into a situation where I have sufficient field gradients that I can actually have a polarizing effect, like I did with this uh, refractive mirror that I described previously. Up there. You mentioned breaking the time reversal symmetry. How would you well, just by applying a magnetic field, <laughs> just a, you know, that, that was all I meant, meant by it. Yes? So, when you were describing this uh, total internal reflection, you were talking about... Uh, external. We typically uh, call it external. Uh, so, uh, you were talking about a polarization, right? Yes. What is the relation between that polarization and the spin-off neutron? 
Okay, so um, in, the, in this picture here, I was not necessarily invoking the spin state of the neutron. So I could use materials that are non-magnetic. And in that case, the interaction that I would be dealing with is simply the strong nuclear force. And I would be having uh, a index of refraction less than one as a result of that. But if I actually have a mag magnetized material, then the spin state does come in and because it will now, uh, depending on the spin state of the neutron, I will either be parallel to or anti-parallel to the magnetization of the material and that will, index, that will influence my index of refraction. And that in turn will index my, influence my critical angle for total external reflection. So that one spin state will, will have maybe be able to propagate in this direction and sort of lose it to my experiment and the other spin state will be propagated in the guide. So people actually now make uh, guide sections which only will transmit one spin state and the other spin states are just lost in that particular segment and so in that way you polarize the beam. So is it uh, correct to say when, when you say that the, uh, you choose a particular polarization of this neutron beam, you are, you are choosing one spin component? Yes. That's, yeah, and my coordination axis is going to be defined by the direction of magnetization of my material. Yeah. There are actually several ways that we can polarize neutrons, but fundamentally it's, it's this kind of effect where I'm playing off the, uh, the nuclear, uh, strong nuclear force, you know, the, the, the interaction with the nuclei, I'm playing that off against the interaction with the uh, internal magnetization of the material. So I can either do it in this kind of geometry, I can also do it with rank diffraction. I can have a material which is magnetic, so it can be a ferromagnetic material, and that will give rise to a mixture of um, nuclear Bragg peaks and magnetic Bragg peaks. And I can be in a situation where I can exactly match for one of the spin states, so I get diffraction, and I cancel the diffraction for the other spin states. So these are kind of tricks that I'm playing, always based on refraction, and always based on um, playing off the nuclear interaction with the magnetic interaction. Selection of a particular spin state is this similar to this Groupster's angle kind of concept that we see in optics? Um, uh, let's see. I okay. I don't think I would. No, I don't. I mean, there's some similarities. Uh, all of the stuff that you write down is rather similar, but. What's very different in this, in this case is that we're talking about two fundamentally different interactions, the strong nuclear force and the electroweak force. Uh, whereas in the case of optics and the Brewster angle, I'm, everything is, uh, uh, it's all the uh, just uh, interaction of uh, light with matter, uh, just the electromagnetic uh, field and material. So I think it's distinct from that perspective. Yes? Okay, uh, detect neutron detection. Yeah. Uh, it's it's basically um, helium three. So so neutron. Uh, sorry. Excuse me. I'm used to a very tall board when it goes up like that. I'm sorry. So okay. So uh, so it's basically neutron plus uh, helium-3 gives um, uh, proton, sorry, uh, tritium, tritium plus, um, plus, plus proton plus, um, I think it's 765 uh, kilo electron volt, no, maybe, sorry, oh, plus, uh, there's some energy as well, I forget the exact number. Uh, but so I, I get, I basically generate a charge um, shower uh, when I interact with the with the um, uh, with the helium three, and this is all done inside a linear um, inside a cylindrical capacitor geometry essentially. So I have a I have a wire inside this detector, and then I I maintain a certain uh, certain uh, potential difference here, typically around 2,000 volts or so. And so then when the neutron comes in, I will I will have um, tritium and, and and protons will then be uh, will then be uh, giving rise to charge pulses which I can amplify um, and detect at that specific time when the neutron arrived. So I'm going to be detecting the neutrons individually um, as a function of time. Typical, 
time scale uh, in the detection 